All righty. Praise the Lord. God bless everybody. With His presence, guys, He is the blessing. Let Him bless you. He's right there. He's ever-present in good times and in the time of trouble. Ever-present in the time of trouble. Don't you love that? Yes. He's always with us. We can holler out and cry out. And it's immediate, guys. You holler out in distress. When you're in distress, He comes a-running. Hallelujah. Don't you love that part? Amen. We're going to re, uh, begin 2 Corinthians today by God's grace. I think that's where he's leading us to go since it's the continuation of the same church. And we're in that church age right now. And this is actually 3 Corinthians, guys. 2 Corinthians we don't have. It was a stout letter that he wrote to them, man. And he was brisk and he was livid and he told them, you guys better straighten up. And God said, well, that's just for this church. Uh, we don't want that in the scriptures, but this church needs to hear this. And so it's not in the canon. It may be in the uh, Bible code of, mm, there, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That would be awesome. Amen. But th there was a second stern letter that he gave them. And then third, third Corinthians is actually what we call second Corinthians. All right, let's begin in that, man. This is, he's writing them again. He says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. How many of y'all believe Paul was God's guy? And he operated in the will of God. I do too. The Bible code says so. I'm going to go with that, guys. I'm going with the Bible code. I'm going with, with the Lord, okay? Because the Lord, all he wants to do is speak to us. The problem with the church, the reason people doubt the Bible code is because they don't like to hear God talk to them. They don't, they don't know how powerful he is. They've not come to know who he is. And they've uh, just, just don't know his spirit, don't know his ways, his ways are past finding out, but the little bit that he's let us know, they still won't believe those either, man. God wants us to know his heart, and he wants you to know his word. And right here at the end of days, he's given us clarity in that word so we all can refine and define God's word, his will. We know what it is because he's spoken to us plainly in these codes, man. He's corrected. Has any of your uh, doctrine been corrected by the Bible code? Amen? Mine too. Mine too. The biggie for me was the Shroud of Turin, and I'm so thankful for that. Praise God. And so Paul, he, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timothy was a guy that he discipled. Timothy was his disciple and he discipled him. You do exactly as I do. I'm doing exactly as Jesus told me to do. I'm following Jesus. You follow me, Tim, and we'll be blessed. And God blessed him, man. And so we hear Paul referring to him a lot. And so Timothy was also a preacher up there with Apollos after Paul had you know, started the church. And he says... Uh, our brother unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in Acacia. Now, remember what we just said about that second letter. That second letter that Paul wrote was just to Corinth. This one here, he says, this is not just to Corinth. It's to all the churches in the region of Acacia. I want everybody reading this one, and that's for us. And he wants us reading it because we are a, a mirror image. The church today is a mirror image of, of the church of Corinth, man, uh, for the most part. Not, not all of us, the Laodicean bunch. OK, uh, who would get fickle and they had they their lives were ran by their own spirit, not the will of God. Paul, his life was ran by the will of God. Timothy was trained to let the Lord God, his scriptures, his word, his heart guide your steps, your emotions, your will. Everything about you is governed in the sidelines between the sidelines of the word of God and the rule book of the word of God. And the church of Corinth didn't like that. They liked Jesus. They got saved, but then they wanted to run their own lives. And he said, she said. And Paul has to write these letters and say, come on, guys, man, let's do everything according to the will of God. And, and this word needs to go out to all the churches in the Acacia area. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful for that one? This church is a sinful church. They are a selfish church. But God still offers his grace and peace even to that bunch. You know, you... Aren't you thankful that he offers his grace and peace to you continually, no matter what kind of mood you were in or how, how big you blew it that day? God offers his grace and peace, and it's an immediate correction when you recognize that you have faltered in any way. You've, you've altered the course of God, the will of God, and he shows it to you. The Holy Spirit speaks to you, and his grace comes and not straighten that out. And boy, and it's immediate, and you're straight. Don't you love that? Don't you love And that's how God guides us, man. That's how he wants us to do. From our God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. We're in 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. How many of you have ever in your life, you've confronted, you've been confronted by the wonderful, awesome, and comfort of God? 
in the middle of a mess, in the middle of pain, in the middle of trouble, struggles, whatever, boom, he's there. And it didn't matter where you were in town or in your house or what part of the country you were in or even out of the country. God's mercy and his comfort can be found there, guys. His word. His word is what brings you the comfort. When you don't have an open Bible in front of your hand, it's the word that you've hidden in your heart and you've meditated on. And guys, that's why your pastor and your teacher, uh, your Sunday school teacher, they don't, they're not better than you. They're, they're not, oh, he just knows the Bible. The reason he knows the Bible is because he speaks the Bible. Okay, if you would take what you know in your heart and speak it to other folks, you'll remember it and the Lord will bring it back. He brings back to memory that which he has placed in there. Even the stuff I thought I forgot, the Lord will bring it back. So we encourage you to share. And that's what the Bible says about success in Joshua 1.8. It's about the, the word of God. You meditate, you share it, you speak it, and then you'll have good success. You'll make your way prosperous. And you'll have good success. And that's what God wants for us to do. Be a successful Christian. Read the Bible. Stay in the parameters of the Bible. Know the rules of the scripture. Know the heart of God. And no matter where you are, whether a Bible's in your hand or not, you could always be confronted by the Holy Spirit speaking a word of the word to you. The Bible. And bringing you great comfort and bringing you great peace, man. He's the God of all grace. And he's the God of all comfort and mercies. Verse 4. And he comforts us in all our tribulation. There is not one time when you've been in a bad situation, when things were not going so great for you, where God wasn't there ready to comfort you. Guys, it can be immediate. It's as soon as you think about God. Remember Jonah? It took him three days. It took Jonah, the man of God, the preacher of God, the prophet of God, it took him three days to remember God. The quicker you remember God, man, the quicker you'll be blessed and comforted in all grace and mercies in his word. Okay? Remember him quickly. That's why you always walk into every situation. Jonah did not walk into the shipyard with God. He did not walk into the boat with God. He did not walk down to the bottom of the boat with God. He did not walk with God when he was on the deck of the ship ready to be thrown off. He was not with God when the whale swallowed him. But God was with him the whole time. Amen. He didn't remember God. But when he was in the middle of, he was about to die from the stomach acids and the seaweed wrapped around his head, he remembered the Lord. And he cried out from the depths and the fish spit him out. And he continued in the ministry of God. And he still didn't walk with God for God in every aspect because he had animosity toward the people he was preaching against. No pastor should have animosity toward anybody in his church. Okay, there should not be a friction. Now, if there is, what did we learn in the last book? If there's sin in the camp, you confront the person and say, hey, listen, man, there's sin in the camp. We can't have this. And you give them warning and then you go with somebody else if they won't take heed. You go with some witnesses, two or three witnesses. And then finally you get them out of your midst so there's no confrontation. God's the God of comfort and rest and glory and mercies. And there are people in the church sent by Satan who wants to stop all that in the lives of everybody that present. So you got to get rid of that mess. You get rid of that thorn and don't let that thorn keep busting you until they repent. Guys, this is key. Hey, girls, you guys, you all remember that passage we talked about? Was it Mark uh, where Jesus talked about when they come to you for forgiveness, that they, they ask you for forgiveness, they come to you and confess, then you forgive them? We, we had a conversation about that. I can't rem remember that. It just came to my mind just now. And so you don't just forgive everybody. I, I don't forgive all these people who are marching through gay, gay day, you know, oh, having their great, wonderful parties. And we don't forgive them because they're not forgiven. OK, they're not walking in the forgiveness. God has totally eradicated their sin, but they thumb their nose at him. Hey, here you go, God. And we don't forgive those people. We don't walk in that blessing. If they come to me and confess their sin, we forgive them. Same way with the people with, with the Bible codes. You make fun of the Bible code. You mock the Bible code. You ain't welcome in this group. If you repent and say, dude, I was, I was totally wrong about the Bible code. I was wrong about God. I, I was against him. I was opposing him. I hated everything the Spirit was saying, the Holy Spirit. I was committing blasphemy against him, and I recognize it. The Lord has shown this to me, man, and I apologize. Come on in. Sit on down. Let's have a good time. We forgive and we go on with that with confession, with repentance, okay? But as long as you are opposing the Bible code, you're opposing God, and I'm God's guy, and you're opposing me with that. I'm the protector of the word. Isn't that what a pastor, a good pastor should be doing? Protecting the sheep and protecting God's word for the sheep, the food, 
the food supply. We don't let the wolves get in there and destroy our food supply. The word of God. And you come in there and you start hating on the Bible code. You're hating on God, pal. And you don't belong in my sheepfold with my sheep. Because I'm here to protect them. God's called me to do that. And you guys that have chosen this Bible study to be a part of, uh, we want to protect you too. We want to be there for you. We pray for you. And we bring you God's comfort, his mercies, his joy. And we're going to continue in that vein of thought here in a second. Verse 4. God comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort others. Don't take all the blessings and hoard them and stick them in your pocket, American church. When the Lord blesses you with comfort, share some comfort with others. When he blesses you with mercy, hand that mercy out. He lets you go through your situations where you can be confronted with his love, his mercy, his comfort, the God of all grace. And now you say, oh, others are are needing that. And God always supplies that need, that comfort most times. No, he, he always start with himself, the Holy Spirit in us comforting us. But he uses us to comfort one another, comfort one another with these words. Aren't we told that about looking for the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ? And he's going to come, the pre-trib rapture. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words that our blessed hope is going to save us from this mess. And so the Holy Spirit is our comforter and we have the Holy Spirit in us. And our job is to help comfort believers who are in tribulation, who are in sorrows, who are down. And we go and, and we bless them. Verse five. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds. He says, man, because we serve the Lord, we're getting beat down all the time. Uh, The devil always sends in his people. He always sends in tares. He always sends in unbelievers. He always sends in fools to try to distract and destroy and hurt and harm. And so as the Lord allows the tribulation to come our way because we're walking in the Lord, he also allows comfort to come our way. We're always comforted out of every one of those tribulations. So we praise God. When tribulation comes, we don't say, what's your problem, God? Why is this happening to me? We know why it's happening to us because the Bible told us. So I can endure that tribulation. I can find the comfort of God and I can meet. I'll bet every one of you sometime along the way has suffered some sorrow from tribulation where you needed comfort and help. Every one of you. And that's where we come along, I come along, they come along and greet you and bring you comfort and joy. As we have received tribulation, we understand the weight of tribulation. We understand the pain of tribulation and we see God deliver us out of that tribulation, bringing us comfort. So now we bring you comfort in your tribulation. We understand because tribulation come, comfort comes. And we want to share not only the tribulation with you, we want to share the comfort of God with you. And that's our calling. And that's what Paul is telling this church, who he had to scold last letter and put it to him. Him skeeters die. Oh, we got him. Praise God. I I, I got to get with Noah on that. All right. All right. Verse uh, five. For as the sufferings of Jesus Christ abound in us, right? Guys, the more you walk with Jesus, the suffering will abound. It's not just, you know, here and yawn and a little bit here. It's going to be continual. And Satan wants to come and attack your body. He wants to come and attack your health eventually. Okay, just look at Job. That's his MO. He doesn't change. Satan doesn't change because he knows if you are weak and wore out and hurting for certain that you're less likely to be comforting others. He wants to keep you down where you're needing comfort. And God, in our stresses, in our distresses, in our pain, we still comfort others because Jesus did that on the cross. He was encouraging John. He was encouraging Mary from the cross. He was encouraging that thief who was guilty next to him on the cross. Jesus is an encourager in the middle of his pain and his people ought to be encouragers in the middle of our pain. Instead of whining and belly aching and complaining, we go and we find others who we know are hurting because we know that all are hurting at some point and we go and we comfort them and the sufferings of christ also abound in us so also the consolation the comforting will abound in us and guys that needs to be our mission instead of focusing on me and woe is me i'm so painful and my joints and my thumbs and everything hurts my knees are killing me and guys we all got that and and we all and i I, when i know that about you i say dude how's your knees doing bro because i care about it because my knees hurt me at work we gotta climb those steps all the time with 100 pounds in my in my holdings you know it it hurts and we understand that but we don't whine and bellyache and complain over our hurts guys don't you know that the lord you're about to get a glorified body we we find joy in that consolation in that comfort in that man we find rest in that we find joy in that and we want to comfort others with that who's going through the same pain oh my body's killing me 
just wait. We ain't got that much longer. We ain't got that much longer. I just, I can't stop these negative thoughts about my past. I was raised in an abusive home. I'm, we're about to get that body, man. We'll never think about those things again. We'll never have a bad day again, man. And we rejoice. We encourage others. All the bad negative thoughts, all the terrible things that have gone down, even the bad stuff you've done to people that you feel bad about, that's going to be gone too. Praise God in this glorified body. Amen. And then we comfort one another with these words. Verse 6. And whether we be afflicted, it's for your cons consolation. He says, we are in pain so we can comfort you in your pain. Because we know that if we're having pain and we're walking with Jesus, you're going to have pain. You're People have pain who don't walk with Jesus. And we understand that. So our, our trouble is a blessing from the Lord, he says. Guys, count your trouble as a blessing from the Lord. Sean found a code about dementia. And God calls it a gift. They don't have to endure today. It's a gift. Dementia is a gift. Can you understand that anything that comes your way is a gift from the Lord? We praise him for all of it because he is good. He's always given. Does God give bad? Does he give evil? No. He gives consolation in the middle of our troubles. The world will bring us bad. The world will break us down. The world will har harm us. Even our family members, they'll harm us, but God brings great consolation. And Paul says, we went through our troubles so we could experience consolation. So now when you go through your troubles, we can bring you help and comfort in the middle of that too. And that's the job of every Christian, guys. We're not to throw people down and throw them under the bus and stomp them while they're down. Okay? We're going to see that here in a little bit if we make it that far. Verse 6. And whether we be afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual and enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And that's what we were saying. We suffer, we're consolated. You suffer, we want to be a part of that consolation, help encourage you and bring you back and bring the Holy Spirit's truth to you through his word and comfort one another with these words. Or whether we be comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. As God has done it to us, experiential pastors... Have y'all ever had a pastor that had no experience and he didn't understand a thing you were talking to him about in your trouble and your midst and, and, and you're like, dude, quit. That guy needs to live a little longer and suffer real badly so he can be comforted so he knows how to comfort the sheep when they come to him broken down and hurt. He can relate to them. And Paul said, all this is so we could relate with you better. And we praise God for our pains. We praise God for our troubles because we know the consolation's coming, the comfort's coming. God's going to solace our souls. And we love that part. How many of y'all love that part? In the middle of your pain, in everything, you give thanks. You know he's going to bring the comfort. You know he has for the last, you know, however long you've lived, for the last 100 times that you have suffered, that you've had an issue, that you've had problems, that there was negativity against you, that the devil was involved, or a family member, which is a lot of times the devil, and all that's involved, and then you know that God has saved you out of them all. Hey, guys, we're not clapping today. We're killing mosquitoes, okay? All right. Uh, verse 6, and whether we be afflicted for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual and enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. What has been done to us, we do unto you for the glory of God. Verse 7. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be partakers of the consolation. And you got to know that we encourage you. All you that are going through trouble right now, you're about to be comforted and about to be comforted ultimately. Uh, we, we have days. Days before that rapture, days before this is all over. Be comforted in this word today, please. Verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia. He says, we need to let you know what happened to us. We're not going to hold this one in. you got to understand the trouble that we faced in Asia Minor, all the churches. You know, the seven churches of Revelation Plus. All those churches. He says, while we were there, we had some issues. We had demon-possessed people come us, the beasts in Ephesus. We had riots in Ephesus. We had sorcerers come against us, Alexander the coppersmith. We had all of that. We had Satan at us, man. We had curses being placed on us, and that means demon, demonic pouncing. You can't have a curse within, but other people's influence who are cursed, they can come and they can harm you along the way as much as God will allow. And he says, we have got to share this with you. I'm not complaining to you what happened in Asia. And he already shared this in the last book, and he probably shared it in the second book that we don't read. 
He says, but you must understand that bad things happen to godly men and women. Bad things happen, and really bad things happen to those who are wanting to serve the Lord, and you are opposing the devil with the light of the gospel. He's really going to come against you. Keep going. Don't quit. And he says, we would not have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us at Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. What the devil brought us was excruciating. The whippings, the stonings, all that is in this list. And everything that happened to us, man, it was out of this world. I never expected when Jesus knocked me off my horse, I'd be going through this, Paul says, when I was first saved. But he's helped me through the enduring of it all. Uh, the trouble came and the endurance was greater. Aren't you thankful for the endurance of the Lord Jesus Christ in you that will overcome, override the trouble that's facing you? That Jesus greater is he that's in me than he that's out there in the world? Aren't you thankful for that? We have the Holy Spirit of God within us, helping us to overcome everything that comes against us from without. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And we were pressed out of measure, man. We, we were under the gun. We were being squeezed. That was a type of torture. They would put heavy rocks on people and squeeze them and have them lay there under their crushing weight. That's the picture here, and it may have happened to them. Uh, England used to kill people that way. That was a type of execution. They would put heavy weight on you and drop it lower and lower and lower and have you die slowly. You couldn't suffocate. Your bones are cracking and breaking. And that's how they killed folks. And that's this picture here that we were pressed out of measure, man, like an olive pressed. Uh, olives don't survive the pressing. Here comes the olive juice. Above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life, we were ready to die. It was so great. It was so intense, this battle that we were in. Death was so much better. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. And we were ready to go on to see Jesus, Lord, if this is it, let it be it, man. Have you all, anybody in this room ever suffered like that? There's a great people all around this world suffering like that today. And we want to pray for them. We want to bring them great consolation and hope through the word of God. We despaired even of life. Verse 9. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. We had... Uh, where there was sin, death came, and our bodies have been ravished. Paul talks about his, his being short, his eye problems, the thorn in his side. And every time he, he would have a flare-up, it was like time to die, man. We had death within us, our bodies, and we had death coming at us from without. He says death was all around us. We were ready to die. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God that raiseth the dead. Said so God, I don't believe I'm done with my ministry yet. You told me I was going to Rome. I feel like dying right now, says Paul, but I, I know that you are the resurrection and you are more powerful than death. And we trust in your resurrection power every day in every situation that we have. Because of his resurrection power, it's important that you learn this power. Our purpose for existing is that I might know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. That's where God wants us, guys. When you're suffering, you sit alongside of Jesus and in your heart, in your faith, you suffer with him as he suffered on the cross. You suffer with him as he suffered in the garden. You suffer with him as he was being beaten and you say, I'm in good company. And it should bring you joy. It should bring you just abundant, abundant joy. And so when we think right, we'll do right. When we think right, we'll have the right attitude and the right heart. And we'll, we can mention our pains without complaining our pains. We can bring glory to the Lord in the middle of our pain, in the middle of our struggle. Even when it seems like I'm on my deathbed, I rejoice in the resurrection power over death. Amen. And so we always rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Complain never. Verse 10. Jesus delivered us so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust. We trust in him. We trust in him that he will deliver us over and over and over and over. Our constant walk, our constant breath, our constant belief and faith is that Jesus has got me. He's taking great care of me. Verse 11. Ye also, helping together, pray for us. God is taking care of us and we know it's because of your praying for us. You guys have prayed and prayed, and God bless you guys that pray for Sean. God bless you guys that pray for the team. Thank you for praying for me. Pray for one another. Paul was grateful for it. He understood where the power could come from. The, the rest, the consolation, the belief is because he knew that many people were praying. for Guys, are you praying for others? You may be the very reason that they suffer 
are, are in joy consolation because of your prayerfulness. That you, you pray for their suffering. Lord, give them peace. Give them grace. All those starving kids in Pakistan, all those people that don't have clean water, we pray for them. Lord God, bring them clean water. And what are we seeing? Wells being dug. Amen. We're praying on this side. They've never seen us. We've never seen them except for the pictures that were shared. And boy, it's, it's a difference when you've seen a little boy bend down with an old cup digging into a mud puddle that's got bugs and amoebas and all kinds of stuff in it versus a spring of living water being poured out of a fountain in the middle of town. Two different worlds, man. And our prayerfulness brings consolation to so many who are in suffering. Pray continually. Get your mind off of you and your day planner and what, what's scheduled for you and what you're about. And get your mind on others, man. Your prayers. Paul said, Jesus Christ is my consolation. But you guys have prayed for us to bring on that consolation, to bring on that hope, to bring on that comfort. It. And we were delivered. Verse 11. Ye also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of any person, uh, thanks may be given unto many on our our behalves <clears throat> we were blessed we were blessed we were blessed we're blessed in your prayers we're blessed in their spiritual prayer we're also blessed in your physical blessings that's what he's talking about you know when they go to town to town they didn't have houses people would offer them their bedroom people would offer them food and they were blessed in the ministry of god and people understood that they were doing this unto the lord as they were blessing they were praying unto the lord lord i'm going to see this guy in heaven soon we're all going to be together in heaven soon and i want to have prayed for you i want to have done the right thing in the presence of the Lord for your sake. And we all need to have that attitude. Do you believe you're about to see Jesus soon? And if you're about to see Jesus soon, do you believe you're about to see those 24 elders and everyone they represent? Take care of all those they represent. Take care of the believers. Take care of the brethren. Pray, pray, pray. Comfort, comfort, comfort. Encourage. 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we had our conversation in this world more abundantly to you word. In other words, he says, we were real deal. We were simple. We didn't over over preach something and, and under simplify something. He says, we were simple. We were sincere. We were real. And that's the way we always are. We tell you like it is. We tell you what the Lord told us. We share it with you. We have no manipulation in mind when we go to preach a sermon like many in Corinth today. Many in Corinth today are preaching with motivations that they may extract out of you. They can squeeze you, squeeze the juice out, squeeze the blessings out, squeeze the money out. And that's what they're wanting out of you to squeeze you, squeeze you, squeeze you until you're no good. And Paul says, no, it's not us, man. We've come with simplicity. We've come with sincerity. And what we say is what we mean. Verse 13. For we write none other things to you than what you read or acknowledge. He says, we have shared with you what God has shared with us. And I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end that we're being truthful. We're being honest. And everything we say is to the glory of God. You've got to find people in your life like Paul. You've got to find people in your life like Timothy. You got to find people in your life like Sean, who loves God, who only wants to bring glory to God and encourage the believers. When you find that person and you know that they come to you in sincerity and truth with nothing extra, nothing extravagant, no, and now you're going to have to pay me for my book. None of that. Just sincerity and simplicity all the way to the end. Verse 14. We're in 2 Corinthians 1 14. As also you have acknowledged, us in part that we are your rejoicing even as ye also are ours in the day of the lord jesus christ in the day of the rapture the day of the rapture we want to have all been praying for one another you for us us for you you have cared for us we want to care for you that's the cycle the beautiful cycle in christianity caring and loving and distribution and grace and mercy and consolation and sometimes when a person is fighting that, fighting the truths of the Lord, you have to rebuke them. And if they won't take the rebuke, you kick them out until they come back with humble, sincere and simplistic repentance. I have not talking in circles. <clears throat> I've come today because of a past issue that we had in the past. We always didn't see eye to eye, but I've come today wanting to see eye to I. Paul says, don't give me that. You whip out your little script, throw it in the trash, 
and say, I've sinned. I've, I've been wrong. I was wrong on that issue, and I've recognized it. The Holy Spirit has, has taught me that I was wrong, and I want to get back in the fellowship of these believers, and I want to be part of being prayed for on, on consolation type things, not that I'll quit sinning. I want to quit sinning. I don't want to harm God. I don't want to be a man, a woman of unbelief. God hates unbelief. People go to hell because of unbelief. That's why they go. Everybody who went to hell went to hell because of unbelief. They didn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And God can't stand unbelief. Oh, I, I got to see it with my eyes. God says, you'll see hell with your eyes. I already told you about hell, and, it, and it's real, and you need to believe it by faith. That's what's wrong, I've, with, the that's what's wrong with the Jews. They've got to see it. they got to see it. So God's about to show them what hell on earth looks like. In the United States and North America, he's going to kill a bunch of Israelis, a bunch of Hebrews, a bunch of Catholics, a bunch of Muslims. He's going to kill a whole bunch of folk. Baptists, he's going to kill them too. All the unbelievers, he's going to kill them. If you're trusting in something else other than Jesus Christ, you're dead that night if you live on the east coast of North America. The rest of us will be raptured, the believers will be raptured, and the unbelievers will be killed in the vicinity of the tidal waves and the bombs. It's going to happen. It's going to happen very, very soon. We're going to encourage you to be a believer in the Bible. Guys, if you don't believe the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible, that our God is big enough to get you the Bible, get you his heart, get you his word, and you won't believe the Bible, you won't believe the Bible code. And if you don't believe the Bible code, you don't believe what God's up to right now. You better know and understand and believe what God's up to right now and be comforted in that. We're not worried about the bombs and the nukes. We're excited about getting snatched out of here and enjoying the ride. We're digging it, man. We have used holy imagination, what God has given us so far, what he shared with us. And we've, by faith, rejoiced with him. We've been comforted by him, and we want to comfort others along the way. Verse 14, as also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing. Uh, we brought you the truth. We brought you joy. We brought you blessings. We brought you the Lord Jesus Christ. We brought you Calvary. And you rejoice in the fact that, man, these guys brought us the truth. Amen. Even as ye also are our rejoicing in the day of the Lord. We're going to be so excited you got saved and you believed when we're all raptured together. We're all in one family. We're all going to be so excited that we all believed God and his word. Verse 15. And in this confidence, I was minded to come to you before that ye might have a second benefit. Okay, here's, here's what happened. He told him, he says, when, I'm gonna, when I come see you, I'm going to come through Macedonia. I'll see you. I'll, I'll visit some more Macedonia, and then I'll come back on my way back to give you a second benefit, uh, to preach again, to have another meeting, to have, have another service going on. Verse 16, and to pass by you unto Macedonia and to come again out of Macedonia unto you and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. So he's, he told him, he said, I'm, I'm going to come see you, and I'll see you twice. And he went to go see him, and he didn't see him the second time because they didn't get it the first time. And he said, I am not going to go back there with a bunch of people and throw pearls before swine. I'm not going to go back there and listen to a bunch of people who won't listen to me. I have to hear them complain and whine, and they will not catch the spirit of the living God. They will not believe the word. I am not going back there until... and." Probably that's when he wrote the second letter. You guys are a rebellious bunch, no matter what he said. It was something along those lines because he said it was a powerful letter right up in their face, right up their alley, man. And he says, verse 17, when I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Was I really sweet and kind about it? Or the things that of purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? We'll keep reading. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silas, at Silvanus, and Timothy, it was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. In other words, they're saying, you guys are saying that Paul's not a man of his word. When he says yes, he means no. And when he says no, he means yes. He said he was going to come by here twice, and he only came by here once. His yea means nay, and his nay means yea. And Paul says, that's not true. Everything that comes out of our heart is real. We are led of the Lord in everything we do. You guys are the ones that kept that second trip from happening. That's, you know, we're going to see that through the Corinthians, how we know that story. Okay, We're just telling you that story up front. 
And that's what happened. You guys kept the word of God. You guys kept the mission of God from happening. And he says, we're not yay, nay, and nay, yay. You could be able to trust us like you can trust the living God. And in him, all things are yay. When he says yay, he means yay, yes. When he says no, he means no. And so do we. And so do true men and women of God who have integrity and fear the Lord in everything. When you fear the Lord, that's wisdom. And in wisdom, you'll always be living in integrity. You'll always do the right thing with the right motivation. You'll say the right things with the right motivation. My yes means yes. And my no means no. God will direct us in that. And that's, that's being true Christians. That's what that's about. Verse 19. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Sylvanus and Timothy, was not his yes means no and his no means yes. But in him it was yes. Verse 20. For all the promises of God are in him are yes. If God made a promise about Jesus, that promise will come true. He will do everything he said. It might not be in your time frame. He doesn't care about your time frame because your time frame is his time. He's one created time. You just trust on, on him, wait on him, be patient. And if he said he's going to do something, he is going to. Do, hey, he's about to rapture the church. He said he's going to do that. And he's about to rapture the church. Why don't you be part of that raptured bunch and believe, 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 and be ready to meet him with integrity. Understand that his yes means yes, and he's a coming. He's going to do what he said, and his reward is in his hand. I'm coming, and my reward is with me, he said. And he's going to reward who? All those who diligently seek God and God's ways, all the yeas, the promises. You have believed all the promises of God is yes, 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 yes. Never that. I don't believe that book. I... God's looking for people who will believe. Jesus, all things in him are yea, and you need to understand that all his promises are coming true. Verse 20, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen. That means true, 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 amen, amen, truth. Unto the glory of God, unto the glory of God by us. God is shining his glory in us. All the truths of Jesus Christ, all the truths of the Bible, the plain text in the Bible code are shining through us. We are people, men and women of integrity, and you need to know that. And you, you need to be a person whose yes means yes and your no means no. 21. Now he which establisheth us with you is Jesus Christ himself. And he has anointed us. He that anointed us has got. Now, guys, this ain't some special anointing. Like the charismatics talk about. Oh, he's anointing. The anointing came upon him. And he began to do cartwheels. And he began to talk in tongues. And, and he began to just to preach. Every one of us are anointed. The Holy Spirit is the anointing one. He is the anointing oil. And if you believe you have been anointed, you have been appointed, that's what that means. When you anoint a priest, it was in the mission of the priesthood. When you anoint a king, it was in the mission of being the king and kingliness. And those people who were anointed were to have the heart and the ministry and the ways of God in their heart, in integrity. And the king's ways, the wise king, would his yes means yes and his no means no. And all of you have been anointed prophet, priest, and king. And we need to live out that anointing now. Paul's no more special than any of us, guys. He just happened to be God's guy that came around at the right time, and he was God's choice. And God used him to do it. He, he, he could have used somebody else, but he chose Paul, knocked him off his horse. Paul obeyed. Paul listened. Paul learned the heart of God and wanted to get us the heart of God. That's what makes God's man God's man. Satan's man wants to get you his heart, his own heart. I, I, I want to suck you in. I want to deceive you. I, I, I want to extract from you. God's man wants to give to you, bless you, give you the riches of his grace, of his mercy, of his bounty, of his love, of his presence, of his word, the plain text and the coded text. We want to give, 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 give. And our yes means yes. And our no means no. And there's a whole lot of people on television whose yes means no and their no means yes. And they don't even know the living God. And they speak of an anointing they have never been under because they're not saved. Everybody who's saved is anointed. That's you, buddy. That's you, sister. Live in your anointing, your calling. Make your calling and your election sure. What calling? What election? I, I don't know what I'm saying. So your prophet, priest, and king. You were told what you are. Live them out. What does a prophet do? The prophet brings God to the people. The priest brings the people to God. And what do kings do? They judge justly. 
righteously out of truth from God's eyes, from his perspective. Discernment, discernment, discernment. Walk in that anointing. You're all anointed if you're a believer. Not only has he anointed us, verse 22, he's also sealed us. Aren't you thankful you've been sealed? Paul's no special guy. He's the only one that was sealed. All believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. The same anointing, the same anointer, and given us the earnest of his spirit. Guys, when God gave his down payment for you, he, that's the Holy Spirit. He gave a humongous, man, magnanimous down payment, earnest payment for you. Not just some cheapo down payment. He gave you the Holy Spirit of God as a promise that you're about to get your new house, that glorified body. Get chewed up, sweetie. Bless your heart. She, she swells up so bad, guys. Has a histamine response from hell. We're almost done, honey. Who gives us, sealed us in the earnest of his spirit. He gave us the promise of his Holy Spirit that you're about to get your glorified bodies. You're about to get your new house. You're about to get heaven. And that's a promise to us. He sealed himself in and he'll never go because God has given you the best of himself and sealed himself inside of you. No, no, no. He just put a seal on top of you and the Holy Spirit comes up on you. Calvary chapels. A whole bunch of fools out there preaching that lie. Very awe. The Holy Spirit of God has placed his seal upon you. And what, what is, when you look at that scroll that Jesus has, it has seven seals on it. It's keeping the scroll closed, these seals. And when he busts the seals, it opens the scroll. And you and I are sealed until the day of rapture. It'll never be broken. You can't break it. Nobody else can break it if the Holy Spirit of God's come inside you and he sealed himself in. And he sealed himself in until the day of redemption. He's so good. He has anointed you and he has sealed you. And he didn't just seal you, you know, with, you know, uh, the lowest rank angel. He's given you himself, the Holy Spirit of God. And he sealed himself in until the day of redemption. Verse 22, who hath sealed us and given us the earnest, the down payment of the spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul because God knows my heart. God, you'll let him know what you've seen when we get to the judgment seat of Christ. You'll know what's there, everybody. I call God, listen, Jesus, am I being honest? Are we being real with the people today? Are we speaking in sincerity and simplicity from your heart? Is our yes, yes, and our no, no? You tell them, Lord, and he will at the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. Amen. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. He said, if I had come here, it would have been worse than my second letter. I would have flipped out on you losers. I would have told you what you were about. It was better that I didn't make that second trip. Verse 24, God knows. He says, I call God. God knows that I shouldn't have made that trip. And we're dealing with what God knows. And you better understand what God knows. And I call him to witness today. It's far better that I didn't come see you. And my yes still means yes. And my no still means no. Y'all ever intended something out of a pure heart and God changed your plans? Anybody? That's how God rolls. You go with him on this. And we call him to record and say, Lord, let him know that you changed the plans. It wasn't me. Verse 24. Not for that we have dominion over your faith. A pastor is not here to govern you and make you make every spiritual decision. We're here to encourage you in the things of God and let the Holy Spirit guide you in all truth. Paul says, we didn't come over here to have dominion as your Lord's. You call me Lord Paul. <laughs> you know, he, he never said that. We're not your lords, we're your instructors. We're helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Verse, chapter 2, verse 1. But I, I determined with this with myself that I would not come again to you in heaviness. I didn't want to come to you anger, in anger. I didn't want to come to you because you haven't grown. I didn't want to come to you because you had thick heads. I'm hoping and praying that through these letters you will grow, God will get it into you. Guys, Nobody, nobody who doesn't read the Bible will get it, will do right. You got to read the Bible. You got to read the letters that Paul writes and stay within the parameters of those letters and do what he's telling you to do, led by the Holy Spirit, knowing that Jesus is saying yes, yes through these letters. And Paul, his man with integrity, is saying the same yes, yes. Read the word, know the word, hide the word, share the word, live the word, and then I'll come back and we'll talk. I've counseled so many people. Hey, Johnny boy, I've got an issue here, and here's my issue. Blah, 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 just rattle it off, 
And then I give them the simple, truthful answer. And they hate it. And they won't do a thing. They wasted my time. Paul said, I ain't coming back there for you to waste my time because my time is limited. I'm about to get my head cut off for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And until you're ready to do something for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, you do your own thing. I've written you the letters. I've preached to you. I was your pastor for a year and a half and you didn't do a thing I said. I am not coming back because if I come back, I'll get right up in your face. And that ain't how I want you to remember me. I want you to follow God. And when I come back, I want it to be a joyous occasion. A time of rejoicing because we all get it. Because we're all on the same page. We're all in unity with God, the anointer and the anointing. We are still with the same Holy Spirit and we're on the same page as heaven is. That's how I'd like to speak to some of you folks. I thank God for you. I thank God for you guys. You are that bunch. You make it a joy for me to come here. Every Sunday. Verse 2. I don't want to come in heaviness. For if I make you sorry... Who is he that maketh me glad, but for the same which is made sorry by me? He says, I'm not here to keep the sorrow rolling. I want, I'd rather exchange the sorrow in for joy. Let's do that. Verse 3. As I wrote the same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to be rejoicing. I want you to get right. Will you please believe God's word? Will you please believe that 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and 3 Corinthians are the word of God to you, Corinth? Will you please believe that and quit thinking that I wrote it and I just shot it out of my tailpipe? Quit thinking that about Sean Mitchell. He's given you the word of God from the word of God, from the verified 66. You people who scoff him, you love your 66. Oh, that's God breathed. You won't even read it. But that's your defense. We'll know at the judgment seat of Christ on the day of Jesus Christ where sincerity and where truth was, simplicity and yea, yea and nay, nay. You guys, all you excuse makers, there'll be no excuse for what you've done. You better believe, believe, believe the 66, every word of it, because God is that big to get his word here. And if you had lived in the parameters of those 66, you would be bringing me joy and not misery right now. You'd be bringing your family joy and not misery. Your church would be so blessed by you if you walked the word. God's calling us all to walk the word and have joy and not misery. I ought to rejoice having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. Seeing you guys grow, progress, that is the joy of every pastor is seeing his little lambs become mommy ewes producing other little lambs. That, that's a joy. Growth, production, expansion, blessing after blessing after blessing. The herd is growing spiritually. We know that in the end of days, the true herd numerically won't grow. But you can grow spiritually. You can mature yourself. And you could be ready to face the Lord. And that brings a pastor joy. That brings a pastor gladness when the sheep are maturing in all things sheeply. Being led by the chief shepherd, the good shepherd, and the great shepherd. Jesus Christ. And God takes his under shepherds to lead. Those who are faithful to the Lord, who are following Jesus like Paul did. Follow those guys, will you? And be a joy to them. Don't be a heaviness. Don't be a weight. Don't be a sorrow. Don't make them have to keep correcting you all the time because you won't be corrected, you rebellious, stiff-necked fool. Verse 3. We are in 2 Corinthians 2, 3. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I come should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to be rejoicing by now. They should have matured, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. Verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Paul wrote in the liquid of tears over the liquid of ink. He was crying while he was dictating to his guys who would write. Oh, I, I wrote you in tears. I'm so sorrowful that you won't grow. I'm so sorrowful that you're so blinded. I'm so sorrowful that you don't understand the devices of Satan, that you are ignorant of the devices of Satan. I'm so sorrowful about these things as I write. Not that you should be grieved, but that you'll know the love which I have for you. I love you guys. I want you to grow. I know the judgment seat of Christ is coming. I know the great judge. I have seen him for two years. I know it's coming. I know it's going to be serious. And I want you guys being able to rejoice at the judgment seat of Christ. Not be ashamed. And he cries and cries and cries as he delivers the message. Verse 5. But if any have a cause, uh, if any have caused grief... He has not grieved me, but in part that I may overcharge you all. 
you're not grieving me, guys. You're grieving everybody around you, and you're grieving the Lord. I know what the Lord can do. I know what he's up to. I know that every man's going to give an account of himself. You guys aren't causing grief for me, and that's not why I come. You're causing grief to the Lord. You're causing grief to the Lord, and until you're ready to change, man, I can't do nothing with you and for you. I will do what we suggested earlier and pray for you. And I'll pray for you over tears, many tears. I write my scriptures over tears, having the love in the heart of God in me as I write. Verse 6, sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. Remember him talking about the guy who was incest with his mother-in-law, or his dad, his stepmom, his dad's wife? He was in an incestuous affair, and we believe that was part of the scolding. And he came back and he repented. He stopped doing that by this time, and this is who we're talking about. He stopped his sin, and the church wouldn't let him back, and the church wouldn't forgive him, and the church was still holding it against him. And all he wanted was fellowship with true believers because he believed Paul's writing while the rest of them didn't. And his life was made hell by the Christian church of Corinth because they had a people who were leading the church who didn't believe the scriptures. And we got one guy out there living the scriptures and who can't be a part of the church. Verse 6, sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted by many of you in that church, so that contrary wise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one would be swallowed up with so much sorrow. You ever been grieved by the church when you were right? There's so many people, oh, that preacher over there, he, he just don't, he made us feel so bad because he preached the truth with tears. There's a big difference in preaching truth with tears, with simplicity, and yes being yes, and no being no, and causing you heartache versus the preacher being a jerk and causing you heartache. You better recognize, you better have discernment what's making you cry, and why you crying. And this poor guy, he sinned, and he was embarrassed. He had to have a letter written to him, and he confessed he got it right, and the church wouldn't receive him back after they kicked him out. Paul said kick him out. If he won't change, they kicked him out. Paul said, if he changes, let him in. And they said, no, we don't like that part. Paul says, yes is yes and no is no. I am writing the word of God in tears. I've written to you in tears. And you guys are still doing this to this guy. He was inflicted much pain by many of you. So that contrary, why you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, verse 7, lest perhaps such a one would be swallowed up in over much sorrow. Wherefore, because of this, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Guys, love repentant folks. When people are truly repentant over their sin, love them, encourage them, welcome them in. Have any of you ever needed the need of repentance and God to forgive you and comfort you? We need to do that to everybody. We don't do it to people who are still rebellious against God. We leave them out there on the curb. But this guy repented. This guy was sorrowful. He quit his actions. He quit sinning. And he said, church, I want to be a part. And they said, nope. Verse 9, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things and you're not. I, I don't want to be a part of any church who's not obedient. And Paul said, that's why I didn't make my second trip back here. You guys won't even forgive a guy who's living godly, who's obeying the truth, who's obeying the love from a God whose yea means yea and his nay means nay. And he told us how to do church discipline in Matthew I told you how to do church discipline in Corinthians, first book, and you guys ain't doing it right. You will not obey God. See, Paul faced the same thing that we're facing today. Paul was the writer of a book, first and second Corinthians, two books, that are now accepted worldwide by Christianity. But at the time, they weren't. And here we are with the Bible code, and the Christian church, Church of Corinth, is not accepting the word of God as the word of God scoffing the Bible code, scoffing the truth of God. God's wanting to give us details right here at the end. We're almost done, guys. Verse 10, to whom ye forgave anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Jesus Christ. Guys, we got to forgive everybody who confesses their sin. I, I've wronged you. Don't hold a grudge and don't belittle them and don't take the place of Satan. Because he tells us right here in this next verse, that is the way Satan does it. Verse 11, lest Satan, you need to forgive these people, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And the whole church today, the church of Corinth, was ignorant of his devices. They had no idea they were being used by the devil 
and bringing this guy great sorrow. He was so sinful. He was, he was just being Corinth. He was just being of his traditions of his hometown. Everybody did this. And then the word of God came and it smote his heart. Yes, meant yes. And he said, okay, I'll do it. And he repented and you church folks won't forgive him. You church folks won't forget it. You hold it over his head. And he says, don't you know that Satan will get the advantage in a case like that? All you church people that came through this, this church group, I love you dearly, but you ain't coming back as long as you're making fun of God and his word. Okay? You repent. You say, I have sinned. I have done great wickedness in the eyes of God and you. We harmed you. We harmed Sean. God's anointed men appointed for this time. It's over with. It's forgiven. Come on in. Let's party. Let's have fellowship. Let's have consolation. But until then, no way, Jose. I'm about to go see Jesus. Don't you know that? Don't you know that you're about to go see Jesus too? You better get it right, pal. You better confess. You better cry out. And we'll forgive you here at this church. This ain't Corinth here. This is Philadelphia. We want to please our Lord. Amen, guys? We want to do the right thing by him because I'm about to go see him. And I'll be charged for what we've done here. That's the last verse. Let Satan, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, and most of the church is. We're going to encourage you not to be ignorant of how Satan rolls and works in your life. And for you to listen to the word of God, you stay in the parameters. That's why we say read your Bible, 10 to 20 chapters every day. You stay faithful in the word, stay faithful in the word, and do what it says. Don't be like Corinth who laughed at the first letter and Paul had to send a scathing second letter and they still haven't changed. Now he's writing this third letter we call 2 Corinthians. And hopefully they'll change. The massive majority hadn't by the time Paul wrote it. Most of you are still holding this against this guy. This guy feels so bad because of all you. One of your church members come down here and told me all this. This is terrible. It's terrible. You forgive somebody who's humble and says, oh, I have done wrong. I have done wrong, and I confess it to the Lord, and I confess it to you people. Please, I need you to forgive me. And the Bible says whenever a man comes to you and asks for forgiveness, you forgive him 490 times a day. When he's sincere in his forgiveness, asking. We need to love one another, and we need to fear God, and we need our yea to match God's yea, and our no to match his no. And be sincere and simple, simplified as possible in our truth, in our answers. Yep, nope. And everybody in the room needs to know that I meant yep or nope when I said that. And believe it. We need to be that kind of people, believing God. Believe God. Do not be ignorant of Satan's devices. And if you're not reading your Bible, you're ignorant of every one of his devices. You are deceived at the highest level if you're not reading your Bible. Your Bible will keep you out of Satan's traps, his devices. Away from his bait, his devices. Please do that for the glory of the Lord. We want to comfort you in these things. Repent. Turn to Jesus. We don't have many days left, and I'm excited about that. Let's go see Jesus, guys. God bless.